Welcome, everybody. The VUG, or known as VCE User Group, is now the Converged User Group. Our new name reflects the broader converged and hyper-converged Dell EMC solutions our members are deploying. So on behalf of the Verge, uh, Converged User Group, I would like you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to welcome you to today's webcast, the hyper-converged infrastructure, learn the basics within Jastra. Thank you again for participating in this webcast and your continued support for Converge. You can learn more about the Converged user group by visiting our website directly after our event today. You should be automatically directed there once exiting this event. So before we begin, I'm just going to reiterate some of the housekeeping items that were previously discussed. First, today's webcast will be recorded and we will have it available for you on demand at convergedusergroup.com by the end of this week. Secondly, we will have a Q&A session that will follow today's presentation. All questions will need to be entered into the Q&A widget window as lines will stay muted through the webinar. With that being said, you absolutely can ask questions throughout the webinar as we will be monitoring it and happy to reply to any questions that may be going through your head at that time or that slide. So with that being said, let's get started. I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Ben Jastrub, Senior Converge Platform Product Manager for Dell EMC. Ben, I would li like to now turn things over to you. Thank you, Erica. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to join us today. So um, again, my name is Ben Jastrub. So I'm part of our Converge Platforms and Solutions Group uh, product marketing team here. So. Really what we wanted to walk through today was um, hyperconverged infrastructure, what it is. This is a very high level overview of um, the technology and the architecture. It's not a deep dive by any means, but hopefully we'll, we'll sort of give you a sense of um, what it represents We're gonna, and um, as well as we'll also introduce the uh, Dell EMC portfolio in the HCI space at a very high level. So let's go ahead and get started. First, let's discuss the key takeaways for this presentation. So what we want you to walk away from is feeling confident that hyperconverged infrastructure is ready for prime time. We're going to spend a little time talking about the market trends, the adoption that we're seeing across our customer base, um, but feeling confident that the technology is matured and that people are deploying it today into production environments. The second is that it really delivers the business agility and the efficiency that companies need today to compete in the digital economy. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but um, it truly is a modern architecture that more and more businesses are turning to to support their um, their new applications as well as their traditional applications. Third is uh, get have a good sense of what our hyperconverged infrastructure portfolio is today and feeling confident that Dell EMC is a leader in this segment of the market, which we think is important and is uh, providing a lot of value to our customers. And lastly, really encourage you to not get left behind. So if you haven't started to look at software-defined data center solutions, uh, including hyperconverged, then you'd start to do so today. So here's a, a very quick summary of what the agenda for the presentation is going to be. As I mentioned, we'll touch upon some of the latest trends and the implications of those trends in the market and what that means from a uh, hyperconverged perspective. We'll then introduce at a very high level the Dell EMC hyperconverged infrastructure portfolio. It's not a deep dive into the products, it's just to give you all a sense of sort of what is available um, in this space from Dell EMC. And then uh, we'll save a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. So let's dig right in. So first thing we want to do is sort of just talk about um, some of the challenges that we hear commonly from our customers around their traditional infrastructures and uh, what those challenges are and how they believe, uh, many customers believe, a, a lot of these processes and issues are going to be unsustainable going forward. So if you look at some of the things that are, that are on the slide, uh, most people say these are common uh, experiences or, or challenges that we face in our environment today. Um, for example, tech refresh is a very common one. So most companies, uh, if they've got a traditional data center, are running some form of a three-tier span architecture that is you know, fairly complex, uh, especially in larger environments. It can be difficult to um, refresh with the latest and greatest storage technology, uh, fiber channel SAN equipment, new server uh, hardware, and often involves risky data migration. So moving the data from one platform to another can be difficult. Um, Another common challenge is that it, it, it's just 
expensive to monitor, sustain, and support. There's a lot of different components involved, both hardware and software, and the compa maintaining compatibility of those components and doing upgrades and monitoring uh, essentially the entire environment can be difficult. Another common issue is implementation times can take, uh, you know, in, in some cases months if not weeks to, to put in a new uh, in, um, set of resources into the environment. So implementation delays can lead to uh, slower time to value for some of these investments in this equipment. Um, in addition to that, just buying new equipment or buying uh, upgrades to that equipment can often require a large capital investment. Um, some customers are saying, hey, I need some more flexibility in terms of how I upgrade or how I deliver new resources for my data center. Um, another very, very common one is operational inefficiencies because in general, IT is, tends to be organized in silos, especially in larger companies where you've got dedicated teams handling just the storage, just the servers, maybe it's the network, um, but that all of the coordination that's required across those teams can create inefficiency. And then lastly, just your typical bottlenecks or hotspots um, that can occur in the traditional SAN and the fact that it can be difficult to scale as new resources need to be brought online to support growing workloads and demand. So these are just sort of some of the common things we consistently hear. And we're going to talk a little bit about hyperconverge is, is going to address these. So when you take sort of all of those challenges uh, together, you know, the belief of Dell EMC is that many companies are sort of going through this process of IT transformation. So they're figuring out how they modernize their infrastructure, their data center, to, hand, to be more efficient for the applications they run today, but also prepare them for um, any new uh, cloud native or modern operations or modern applications that may be developed in the future. So what most companies we talk with are, are shooting for is to really move to more of what we call a cloud operating model. And remember, cloud isn't a place, it's really how you run and operate the, the data center and the processes you use to do that. And the reason why people um, are trying to move into this model is that it gives them that flexibility and that that efficiency to be able to recognize, act, and benefit from changing business circumstances. So giving them the flexibility and the agility to respond and respond very quickly when um, there's a request for new infrastructure or the infrastructure needs to provide a service to support a critical application, a critical business process, whatever it might be. So it's really, at the end of the day, all about agility. And Hyperconverged has an important role to play there. So. Companies are recognizing we need to transform and do things differently. Um, where are they actually investing to make that a reality? So one of the recent studies Dell did was called the Digital Transformation Index and um, essentially surveyed several thousand CIOs, IT uh, leaders to say, where are you planning to invest to make this a reality? And the top response was, hey, we're, we're putting our money into conversion, hyper-converged infrastructure to solve some of those traditional infrastructure challenges. So, you know, there's lots of other things that they're also investing in, but it was it was very telling that, you know, the top investment area was at the infrastructure layer. Everybody's trying to modernize that infrastructure to allow them to do um, some of the things that are required to, again, operate in that digital economy. So with, with those trends in mind, let's talk a little bit about specifically what hyperconverged infrastructure is and what role it has to play here. So... This was a really good definition um, from Tech Target that sort of summarizes it in a crisp way. Hyperconverged infrastructure uh, enables compute, storage, and networking functions to essentially be decoupled from the underlying infrastructure and run on a common set of physical resources that are based on standard x86 components, so a standard x86 server. And that's very different from a traditional SAN environment where you've got those sort of uh, uh, components being very separate and independent of each other and can operate independently. So when you think about the key building blocks that go into HCI, um, these, are the, these are the big ones. The first being software-defined storage. That's really the layer, that uh, the software layer that abstracts the storage functions from the server hardware itself from the local disk. It, it pools those resources into a single shared pool of capacity. So just like... VMware and vSphere did for compute, software-defined storage does for local server-based disk. 
You can provide a lot of automated uh, functions, including provisioning. It, it does automated load balancing. But just like server virtualization, we're talking storage, uh, storage virtualization. Um, another key ingredient, again, is the other virtualization layers have both the compute and the network layer. So uh, that same abstraction is occurring across those physical resources as well, which gives you greater ability to share and also improves utilization, mobility, and security. So uh, those are some of the key software pieces. Then, again, you have sort of the hardware building blocks, x86 servers with um, the latest and greatest uh, high-performance processors, large amounts of memory, uh, new server, rack on servers, all include flash media for that very predictable, consistent performance. So you've got latest generation of servers as well as high-speed Ethernet networks, which connect all of these servers and nodes together to create essentially your, your cluster or your pool of um, virtualized resources that uh, is the underpinnings of um, an HCI architecture. So you put all of that together, and essentially what you're doing is creating what you used to create with a traditional SAN and discrete components, but now based on standard x86 servers, Ethernet switches, and powerful virtualization software. And just to sort of graphically illustrate that shift, if you look on the left, you sort of see a representation of a traditional SAN and even what a traditional converged infrastructure represents. So if you're familiar with our B block and VX block systems, this would be you know, sort of what's under the hood of those converged systems. It's a, a separate storage array tied to uh, the server with using a traditional SAN networking equipment. So fiber channel-based uh, MDS equipment from Cisco, for example, or Cisco Nexus uh, uh, networking switches as well. So you compare that to a hyper-converged uh, solution and you're essentially seeing a lot of that replicated with the server and then with high-speed Ethernet switching. And the reason why that's even possible is that the servers have just become much more powerful um, over the last few years. And with all of the innovation that's going into server technology with these high-core CPU counts, um, again, more powerful processors, extremely fast and efficient flash media, and you couple that with high-speed Ethernet, 10 gig Ethernet, what became 40 gig Ethernet, soon to be 100. Um, you have very robust servers and networks that are able to handle a lot of the traffic and the workload processing that typically was, you know, required specialized hardware. So the beauty is that in this architecture, what we can do is using software, um, scale out your server platforms tie them together through that very fast Ethernet network, and then the software itself, in this case we're illustrating software-defined storage, pooling the resources together to create essentially, again, that server-based SAN. So all of that innovation that's happened at the server, at the network level, is now um, able to provide a foundation for hyper-converged infrastructure. Um, just some interesting data points we want you to consider around sort of the adoption here. So the segment itself um, has probably been around for, uh, you know, four or five years um, from its infancy. So we're, we're hitting the point where it's beginning to mature and mature rapidly, and more and more companies are really embracing the architecture. So um, this is a great data point from 451 Research, which says, you know, this this calendar year, more than 60% of companies out there will adopt some form of hyper-converged infrastructure in their environment. So it's no longer sort of a side uh, project or something that people are kicking the tires on. It really is becoming a mainstream architecture and a mainstream answer for building modern infrastructure. So a common question becomes, okay, that's great. So where are people actually deploying uh, hyper-converged infrastructure in their organization? And the answer is really across the board, but most importantly, it's in the core data center itself. So initially, some of the solutions, especially in the appliance uh, form factors, which were smaller, the perception that was that that was really an edge deployment um, sort of use case, right? So people are going to put uh, smaller form factors, smaller amounts of infrastructure at these edge locations. Maybe it's a regional office to run a very small VDI environment, for example, that was a popular use case. But in reality, more and more of the deployments are actually occurring in uh, the core data center. So it's being 
deployed alongside traditional architectures, alongside traditional converged infrastructure, um, but the belief is that it's going to continue to be a great way to sort of implement that version of a software-defined data center, and the research supports that. So let's take a quick look at what, you know, is really driving the interest here. So this is just a, a high-level summary of what some of the key drivers are for HCI, the first one being agility. So again, businesses just need to be able to respond to threats or opportunity much quicker. Oftentimes, that type of agility is difficult to achieve on-premises with a traditional architecture. So that's the first thing. The second is simplicity. So overall, simplifying your operations. If software-driven uh, architectures can deliver more automation and simplify that lifecycle management uh, of the infrastructure once it's installed, that's a good thing, and hyperconverged ju does just that. So a lot of companies are looking at it just to simplify their overall operations. Third being modernization. So we talked a little bit about some of the technologies that go into an HCI infrastructure. Um, you know, really the driver here is people want that public cloud efficiency and the economics that come along with it, but they want to be able to uh, leverage that with their on-premises infrastructure. So it's delivering a lot of that same efficiency and uh, economic flexibility, but now it's under your control and it's within your, your data center walls. Um, the last one is scalability. So that ability to really start with a relatively small footprint and easily scale it up uh, and out as more and more resources are needed based on application demands without sacrificing performance. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. But the big goal is really improving efficiency and lowering operational costs. So we'll step through each one of those in a bit more detail. The first we'll cover is business agility and how we do that. Um, when you think of the benefits of hyperconverged, some of the, the big things are really just, again, speed, right? There's, there's less time for uh, developing new applications and services because infrastructure is ready to go. It's easy to spin up and tear down. Um, so application development is much simpler in many cases. Uh, it also allows you to very flexibly and quickly respond to changing business conditions if you find you're underutilized or overutilized in a particular area, maybe you're running low in capacity or you need additional compute uh, to support your applications, you can very easily um, add and provision those resources almost on demand. The third uh, bullet here referenced under benefits, elasticity is another key one. So can I quickly and rapidly expand the deployment of the infrastructure without requiring um, extensive planning, testing, things like that? So. Uh, speed, agility, elasticity are all things you sort of hear as benefits of hyperconverged architecture. Another, again, is, and this is really critical, is the simplification of the operational environment. So when you think of traditional SAN, right, in many cases, companies have sort of organized their IT teams around these, um, these resource silos. So you might have that dedicated server team, you could have a dedicated group focused on just the storage arrays uh, across the board, touching the network, touching virtualization, and even the application environment. What that tends to do, especially in, in for larger customers, is create complexity. It means you've got teams that now have to coordinate very closely to make sure um, the operation runs smoothly. It also means you likely have specialized skill sets within those teams each of them is using uh, specific management tools and consoles, so um, there's a lot of dedicated resources and a lot of specialized resources to sort of orchestrate that environment, not to mention complicated processes to keep everything compatible and running at peak performance levels. So in the hyperconverged space, much like traditional converge did to a degree, we're really trying to break down those silos to make it much simpler to deploy, much easier to upgrade, and much easier to support because now the infrastructure is treated as one single entity, an entire um, solution or system. Um, so it's a pool of virtualized resources. And what that allows you to do in many cases, because it is software defined, is automate many of the manual administrative tasks that are required for traditional infrastructure today. It also in many cases allows you to use uh, you know, fewer tools, sometimes a single tool to manage that environment. So Streamlining the management of the operations is, uh, is a critical piece. 
Um, the one of the other important aspects is that all of the hyperconverged solutions in the market today, whether they are appliances or rack scale systems, they incorporate a lot of the modern modern architectural attributes that Dell EMC believes are going to be fundamental to creating a modern data center. So things like flash media, um, solutions that are cloud enabled from the start. Uh, they've all got to be able to scale very easily, especially as you grow and be simple to manage with very few resources. Um, software is, is critical to the underpinnings, right? Everybody wants to automate more and more of those management functions. Uh, they want to be able to program the infrastructure, if you will, to deliver services. So uh, automation, software defined is a big piece, as well as trust. The infrastructure must be trusted and secured. Um, things like data encryption, data protection, all of these aspects are part of uh, hyperconverged infrastructure solutions today. And the benefits of some of that is, you know, th this is a, a really good example of um, just re reduction of overall footprint and how we can improve efficiency by doing that. So you think of some of these modern server architectures and the densities of some of these Ethernet switches just from a pure hardware footprint standpoint, a lot of companies are finding that when they move to a hyperconverged infrastructure, they can greatly reduce the footprint in their data center. So this is an example of uh, a company that Gartner profiled last year showing they were able to cut their rack space from 16 racks down to just one, um, which you know, in turn greatly reduced not only their power costs but their cooling costs and just freed up space either for new investments or um, you know, for some customers who might have uh, a co-location data center where they're paying for essentially the space they consume, this, this adds up to tangible savings um, and dollars in their budget that they're not dedicating to the infrastructure. So it's just a great example of some of the efficiencies you can gain with these more uh, modern HCI solutions. Uh, and the fourth one we mentioned as far as the key drivers was scalability. So this is just a very simple representation of how uh, the differences between how a traditional stands, scales, and grows in a hyperconverged solution. So, you know, you think about the, the capital investment required to get uh, started with even a small stand, it, it can be fairly significant. And then when you upgrade that environment, you know, you're adding chunks of servers, chunks of disk, uh, perhaps a new storage array, but, you know, sort of bigger building block steps as more resources are required. Uh, and sometimes at the, you know, that could be occurring when there are resources within the SAN that are underutilized. Um, you're adding more storage, even though there might be a silo of capacity that it hasn't been tapped into. So what Hyperconverse is trying to do is, one, not only allow you to essentially purchase what you need up front um, uh, without having to overbuy or overpurchase because you're unsure what the requirements for your applications and your workloads are going to be six months from now, 12 months from now, sort of just buy what you need to get started and then as you scale, it's really as simple as adding additional nodes to the environment. And those nodes could be heavy on compute uh, processing power, they could be very storage dense, storage focused, so you're really adding the resource that you need at the time you need it in an incremental way. So it gives you much more, uh, uh, a much more efficient way to scale the environment. And then you take all of those things in consideration, and um, when you add it all up, you know, and you're, you're avoiding some of the, those challenges we talked about up front as far as tech refresh, uh, large investment up front, the fact that um, upgrades typically require uh, a, a fairly heavy lift because of the complexity, because of data migrations, the fact that I need to over-provision uh, resources because I'm not sure what my growth is going to look like. You add all of that together, and you contrast it to what you would get with hyperconverged infrastructure, what we're finding is that most customers believe the total cost of ownership for those solutions is going to be over 30% less, and in some cases much, much higher than that, um, because you're breaking down those silos, you're enabling that pay-as-you-grow grow approach, uh, you're eliminating data migration altogether because everything has been virtualized and is part of a, a, a single pool of uh, resources. So. Um, the, the economics are, are, are pretty significant. We're seeing more and more customers as they adopt, you know, going back and looking at some of the uh, total cost of ownership savings. But um, this seems to be very consistent, not just from what we see from our customer base, but also what 
the analyst research is telling us. So it, it is a fairly compelling um, economic argument. So that all sounds great. What are the workloads I can actually run on hyperconverged infrastructure? So a very common question. Uh, and then, you know, we pose, I would like to pose a, a true or false scenario as hyperconverged infrastructure, it's only good for VDI. Is that true or false? The answer is it's false. So when we look at what people are actually deploying on Dell EMC, HCI solutions today, it's an extremely wide variety of um, not just cloud native workloads, but a lot of traditional workloads as well. So all of your standard business applications that you would normally think of running in a SAN, customers are moving to hyperconverged infrastructure to support those. Um, but they're also looking to deploy uh, a lot of the tools and frameworks required for cloud native workloads. Um, you see some of the, the logos here on the slide, whether it's uh, Docker and contain, uh, container environments, maybe it's Pivotal Cloud Foundry for uh, next generation application development. Maybe it's an OpenStack environment. It's an extremely wide variety of workloads uh, that's being run on these infrastructures today. So now that we sort of set the context and gave an overview of the trends in the market and uh, some of the drivers behind the adoption, let's just very quickly give a summary uh, overview of what's in the HCI portfolio from Dell EMC today. So this is a, uh, a nice summary slide that sort of encapsulates um, the primary offers within Dell EMC's HCI portfolio. And to start, you know, it's sort of broken up into two segments, if you will. The first are what we call hyperconverged appliances, which you see on the left with the VX rail and the XC series. The, on the right side, you have what are considered uh, HCI rack scale solutions. So what are the differences? The first main difference is that you basically have uh, uh, the networking either fully integrated into the architecture, which is what the rack solutions provide, or it's um, the network becomes customer supplied, which means you would uh, continue to own and operate the top of rack switching that the appliances would plug into as opposed to having it fully baked into the architecture of the rack. Um, and then when you, you look at the, the sort of the, the personalities, if you will, the flavors of the appliances and the racks that you can get, uh, the key difference is really the software that's built into those systems. So, for example, VxRail is purpose-built, as you can see here, for vSphere environments. It is engineered by the VMware software team as well as uh, the, the VxRail team here at Dell EMC. It is built 100% to run vSphere, um, and it has all of the, the VMware software stack uh, that you would expect under the hood. So vSAN for the software-defined storage layer. Uh, it can integrate with some of the higher level frameworks like vRealize Suite or um, VMware's NSX software-defined networking. It comes with a fully um, architected uh, resource manager, so VxRail manager to orchestrate the entire system. But it's basically built for applications that and, and customers who have standardized on VMware for their data center. Uh, we also have a flavor of that with VxRack SDDC, so a lot of those same software underpinnings, um, the VMware Cloud Foundation, are built into the SDDC architecture. But now you're also including that Ethernet networking um, fabric that we talked about inside of the VxRack. So as you scale to bigger and bigger environments and larger cluster sizes, that becomes a critical thing. So uh, th those are sort of the two v the, um, hyperconverged offerings that are standardized for VMware, but then you also have some choice and flexibility for those scenarios where you might want to run uh, additional hypervisors or operating systems than vSphere. So for the XC series, you can um, support not just vSphere, but also Hyper-V environments, potentially a KVM environment. Um, Dell has been very successful with the XC series, has a lot of customers who've adopted and deployed it. Um, that continues to be a part of the portfolio, as well as our VxRack Flex system, which, um, much like the XC series, allows you to run not just vSphere, but uh, a wide range of hypervisors, as well as even you know bare metal servers for some of those scenarios that a workload in the data center might require um, bare metal as opposed to a virtualized environment. So some flexibility around uh, the, that rack scale solution. Um, 
but you take it all together and essentially you've got some some you know a wide range of options depending upon what your operating environment is like how inclusive you want the network to be in the architecture and how big you want to scale so we'll just take a quick look at each one of these a little bit more again VxRail if you're a vSphere shop and you're looking for something simple for um, your vSphere environment you've got VMware trained administrators VxRail is a great place to, to start if you're interested in getting getting uh, into the game with HCI we've had tremendous success success with that uh, offering within the last 12 months since it's been released um, the growth rates have been and adoption rates have been really astounding and this is a good example here with um, with rent a center who faced a lot of the same challenges many customers do their infrastructure was just it was aging, it was time to refresh and modernize. Um, they were constantly spending time and resources um, adjusting the infrastructure to make sure they can maintain performance and scale. So they were a VMware shop, they were interested in doing something uh, more modern and that was easier, easier to administrate. And they chose VxRail along with uh, VMware's Horizon solution for BDI. They also layered on top NFX and be realized, but you know, their, their big gain was that not only were they able to get the VxRail up and running extremely quickly, um, they also found that it greatly reduced their administrative overhead. So you're cutting deployment time down drastically. You're freeing up cycles for your, your um, IT staff to go work on other things. They also just found that they were able to reclaim a lot more storage space. Um, so as their utilization improved and they were doing that in a smaller footprint, that also reduce some of their requirements and the costs on the power and the cooling side. So it's a, it's a good example of uh, a VxRail customer and the workloads they're running today. The next uh, appliance we spoke about was the XC series. So again, this is for customers who may have requirements beyond just vSphere, um, Hyper-V and KVM type of scenarios. And uh, if you still want that very uh, simple architecture ease of use, pay as you grow sort of um, package, uh, which is what the appliance delivers. So another customer example here is Harris County, Texas, and uh, they were really facing performance issues with some of their core uh, mission critical applications. Management complexity was, was a challenge for them as well. And uh, their, their traditional SAN just was too slow to be able to uh, deliver VMs um, to their application owners. It, it, the process just took too long. So it was delaying important projects. They knew they needed to make a change. They went with the XC series. They found that um, it was a great fit for not only their Microsoft environment, but also their VDI solution. And um, their biggest benefit was one, the floor space reduction. They were able to cut it by about 80% because of the consolidation they were able to achieve. And then that simple infrastructure management uh, through that user interface for the XC series greatly reduced administrative overhead and freed up time and resource there. So not only did the overall performance of the environment improve, but they gained a lot more efficiency, a lot more agility by moving to a hyper-converged uh, solution. So those were the two appliances in the portfolio. We talked about how the rack, VX rack systems incorporate the network and the reason why that's so important is that as you begin to scale these environments and you're correct connecting uh, you know tens dozens of nodes together um, that network becomes you know that the, the fabric that all of the communication between the nodes uh, has got to run over so how you design the network how you plan for future growth um, there's a there can be complexity there and you really got to have the expertise to do it properly to maintain performance as you scale. You don't want to look like this guy on the right, let's put it that way. So what we're seeing is that as, as the adoption rate increases and more and more customers are looking to consolidate workloads and do more in these environments, there's a recognition that that networking infrastructure uh, is going to be critical to maintaining those performance levels and handling all the traffic that happens between the nodes and the cluster. So tight integration with the overall solution makes a lot of sense. And that's exactly what we're we're doing here with our VX rack system. So, um, like we said, there's sort of two main flavors. The first is VX rack SDDC, which is really built for those VMware standardized um, customers who 
are comfortable with VMware software, you are familiar with their tools, they um, believe in VMware's vision for a software-defined data center and want a very turnkey solution for delivering that, um, the VxRack FDDC is a perfect fit. And um, a lot of customers are starting to evaluate, hey, does this make sense for me based on the size and scale of my, my environment? So great example of uh, a customer moving in this direction is uh, a government agency over in, in the Asia Pacific region. They are looking at deploying a VDI architecture, uh, uh, starting with just a few thousand users, but growing very rapidly up to over 20,000 in the future. So you, you can just imagine the number of devices that are going to be relying on that infrastructure to provide um, provide performance and services. So uh, they actually chose the VxRack SDDC because of, again, the tight integration with VMware, uh, VMware software stack, Cloud Foundation in particular, uh, plus a lot of the robust services we can wrap around the delivery of that. And they chose uh, SDDC to essentially be that modern infrastructure platform for that large-scale VDI environment. So it's going to deliver the predictable performance and scalability that they couldn't achieve with their traditional SAN environment and, uh, you know, the overall budget and cost, it's going to give them a very predictable um, sort of an infrastructure. So as they scale, they're going to know exactly what the investment is going to be to add resources to support the growth in, in their VDI solution. So great example of a, a customer moving to VxRack SDDC. And then lastly is the VxRack Flex. So again, the name, the term flex is in the name for a reason. It's, uh, it really is um, delivering a lot of the choice that our customers expect uh, in the core data center for a very wide range of their traditional and cloud native applications. Still gives you that ability to start with a relatively small footprint and scale it out as resources are needed. So uh, we're seeing tremendous adoption of this platform, uh, especially within the last six to nine months. Um, customers are really starting to uh, put this in production and, and put it through its paces. Um, Flex is based on Scale.io, I should mention. So Scale.io has been uh, a part of the, the Dell EMC portfolio for a number of years. Um, it's extremely scalable software-defined storage and uh, gives you, again, that, that heterogeneous sort of flexibility as far as what you would run on top of it. And, a uh, great customer example of somebody deploying Flex today is Woolworths Limited. So this is actually a traditional uh, VBlock customer as well as a uh, VxRail customer. It's a, it's a very big um, company. They've got, uh, you know, big data center deployments, but also lots of remote and regional offices. Um, so they're, they're leveraging the power of the portfolio to deploy converged and hyper-converged into those different areas. But they chose Flex specifically to operate a, uh, a new robotics warehousing application that they were bringing online. And uh, they also wanted it to integrate very tightly with their management tools uh, to give them some remote management capabilities. So Flex made a lot of sense for them. Um, they found they were able to reduce their cost by about 50% with some of the remote management um, features and uh, the integration with their existing operations. So seeing an immediate cost reduction there, but Again, because it's an engineered turnkey solution, um, they were really able to just rapidly integrate it into their environment, get that new robotics warehouse application up and running, uh, and then leverage you know, Dell EMC single support model to handle any issues that may come up after the fact. So uh, this is a great example, though, of a customer that is leveraging the entire portfolio based on what their specific workload and application needs are. So. That's just a, a very high-level snapshot of the appliances and rack scale systems that we have uh, in the portfolio today. Um, you can find out lots more details on any one of these offerings um, just by checking out the, the Dell EMC website. Um, but one thing we did want to talk briefly about before we move to Q&A is um, something we introduced last week or a couple weeks ago at Dell EMC World around uh, our financial services program for uh, these HCI solutions. So you may or may not have heard or saw the announcement, um, this new program called Cloud Flex, which is being offered by Dell Financial Services. But essentially what customers have said is, you know, look, I want to be able to have uh, or achieve some of those cloud-like economics 
and eliminate some of the acquisition costs that are typically associated with traditional infrastructure. I want to eliminate those and move to more of a, a an OPEX model. So let me just pay as I go for what I'm using and essentially rent the, the, uh, the infrastructure that I need as opposed to buying it all up front and writing a big check. And that's exactly what CloudFlex is designed to do. So it eliminates um, any purchase up front. There's no money required if you buy a new appliance or buy a new rack scale system. You're essentially uh, paying as you go and renting the equipment on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, What's great about that is that you essentially get to uh, experience the benefits of hyperconverged without making a long-term commitment, as opposed to you know traditional infrastructure that you just purchase all together up front. Uh, another great feature is that it, the price actually goes down over time. So you would start with a particular monthly rate for that first year, and then each successive year the price reduces. Um, to basically maintain, you know, stay competitive with the decreasing price of the technology. Um, the only obligation you have is essentially for that very first year of payments. Uh, once you hit that five-year mark, you could um, purchase the equipment outright, continue to rent it, uh, and make the, the monthly payment or return it and, and uh, move on to something different. So really the only obligation is for that first year of payments. And then after that, you could return it at any time. So it's, it's really changing the way you can procure and uh, operate the infrastructure from a financial standpoint. It gives you now an option that is, is similar to what a lot of the public cloud providers have been delivering, but now something that's fully on-premises and under your control. And then just, you know, as we sort of get to the close here, a lot of folks say, you know, what are the opportunities for me to get started and, and, and get um, hyperconverged infrastructure into my environment? And some, some common scenarios we see are, you know, just there are net new workloads, greenfield applications, a new project comes up, um, maybe it's for a new database, maybe it's for a VDI environment. Um, these tend to be great opportunities where new infrastructure is often required. Um, and you've got an opportunity to check out hyperconverse as a potential solution. So that's certainly one scenario where companies are looking to adopt. Another is just your standard server or storage refresh. Um, if it's an aging environment where you want to go with something new and modern, uh, as opposed to just evaluating traditional storage or traditional servers, um, hyperconverged infrastructure could be you know, a, a more transformative approach to how you modernize that data center. So we see a lot of customers considering HCI when those classic refresh opportunities come up. The third one is, you know, you've got a large regional office or remote office, uh, maybe it's a, a number of remote offices where you need a, uh, an infrastructure that can be sized for that smaller footprint. It doesn't require centralized management or advanced skills to administer. Um, this is where we see a lot of success with the appliance offerings in particular. This is a great use case uh, for HCI. And then lastly, just your, your test dev environments. Um, you know, a lot of developers require or, or demand uh, infrastructure that's extremely agile and easy to spin up and tear down. And HCI fits that uh, profile extremely well. So these are just some common ones that come up. Um, but uh, ones we hear over and over again. So just to, to wrap things before we get into the Q&A, you know, hopefully you feel comfortable that um, hyperconverged infrastructure, the technology is mature. Um, companies just like you are deploying it extremely um, frequently now. It is no longer a, considered a small segment of the market or a fringe area of the market. It is ready for prime time. And we encourage you, if you haven't looked closer into it, to, uh, to do so and, and talk to the, the folks here at Dell EMC who've got a lot of experience with not just the technology but with customers like yourselves as far as um, deployment goes. So um, we also said, you know, hopefully have convinced you that HCI is able to deliver the agility and efficiency that um, people expect with some of these modern technologies. We covered the portfolio at a very high level, but um, you know we're seeing adoption of those those offerings uh, really take off within the last 12 months, and we just encourage you to uh, take a good hard look at HCI for some of your infrastructure needs today. And now we'll move on to Q&A.
Okay, so we do see a couple of uh, questions in the chat window or the uh, Q&A window. We can certainly go through those um, right now just to recap, and then if there are any additional ones, please feel free to submit them. But uh, um, just starting at the top of the list, it looks like, you know, that one, there was a question, is there a performance limitation in um, these HCI architectures because of vSAN, so vSAN referencing the software-defined storage layer, you know, is that something I'd have to worry about versus my, my vBlock environment? Well, you know, the answer um, we basically typed in was, you know, if designed properly and sized properly, there really shouldn't be a concern about performance. Now, again, a, a vSAN and, and say the VX Rail appliance, right? You're probably talking a much smaller environment maybe than you would be with your V block, at least if it was only a few appliances to start with. Um, I think the critical thing to just think about, as we were mentioning, is that the network becomes really important for all that node to node communication. So, you know, if there's going to be a bottleneck that appears, most likely it's going to you know, start to um, manifest itself as a result of the, the network more than anything else. Now, I'm not trying to say that. You know, vSAN is all things to all people, but um, what we have seen is that, you know, the adoption that has occurred uh, primarily with VxRail, people are deploying lots of different types of workloads on the appliances. And I think if the network is configured properly um, because of the, the, the hardware and the software uh, design, you can run, you know, quite a bit of different workloads on that in that uh, cluster. Um, and the same goes for the rack scale uh, deployments as well. So those are really designed to take what you're building with vSAN and vxRail at an appliance level and bring it up to, you know, hundreds, potentially a thousand nodes, all within a completely integrated network architecture. So if you're talking about pushing extremely high levels of uh, um, traffic and throughput, it's pretty impressive what the VX rack can deliver. Do you, do you know the one? Um Mike asked about CloudFlex. Yeah, so we had, a, DSS. we had a couple of, right, yeah, a couple of questions just on the CloudFlex um, program, which we're really excited about. So the, you know, the first one was really just, what am I obligated um, to pay if I return the equipment, say, after that first year? And really the answer is there's no additional payment or penalty required. It's really just that first 12 months worth of payments that essentially you're on the hook for. Um, so. After that, you know, you can return the equipment at any time at no additional charge. So it really is a big shift in terms of the way you can procure and purchase uh, these types of solutions versus, you know, probably what you're used to today with, with the V-Block. Although we have done in the past some creative financing around, you know, V-Block and the, uh, the block architectures. This is definitely a much uh, larger approach and a pretty significant shift, and a lot of that is a result of the, uh, you know, the power that Dell brings. Um, to, to EM, what was EMC and VCE, um, and the flexibility of being a private company. So, uh, does that does that partner go through a partner with that, or do you, or direct to Dell Financial? That's a good question. I would say so. It is fairly new. Um, my guess, and again, don't quote me on this. I think most likely a partner would probably engage with a representative from Dell Financial Services um, if there, you know, if there's going to be any specific. I think questions or details related to the program. I think um, you as customers would most likely want to have somebody from the DFS group engaged and uh, answering those. But we we'll certainly could get you to the right folks um, to be able to give you an overview of exactly how the program works and then what the uh, you know what the cost would be if you were actually considering buying an appliance or a rack. So I also, another question here, this is one from Robert. Can you explain a bare metal deployment? Uh, I think it's trying to say in, with ScaleIO is possible if virtualization of an application is not possible. So, uh, or is also possible. So yeah, I think when you're talking bare metal deployments, right now really the answer there is, is uh, VX Rack Flex. So um, we definitely have customers that are interested in running essentially VX Rack with ScaleIO on those nodes. Um, no vSphere, no hypervisor at all. Um, they just want that bare metal deployment. So the the answer there is definitely uh, flex. And the, all of the others would include virtualization at the compute layer. Uh, preferred backup solution would be XRAC. So uh, as Alan just typed in, it's really you know recover point for VMs. 
but we also integrate tightly with Avmar and Data Domain. So um, we're still working on essentially just like in the in the B block world, incorporating the data protection technologies into the RCM process. Um, a lot of that is going is moving along very quickly, but we definitely have customers already using those technologies in conjunction with um, the X rack to do backup, um, local replication, remote replication, things like that. And I think we'll just continue to see the options there expand as engineering and uh, QA continue to test out, you know, additional uh, combinations of those technologies. The network question, Greg, for you. Uh, question from Don, what are the major design considerations for the network to accommodate the chattiness of the nodes when you build an XP solution? Um, so I think also similar sort of question if it was a VX rail as well, right? So the, the networking itself is going to be um, provided by you as the customer. So the topper X switching that's going to connect the appliances and the nodes together is going to be your network. I don't know as much about the XT series, but I do know on the VX rail side, they've essentially tested and qualified with very specific um, top of rack switch manufacturers um, beyond just Cisco, for example, and they've got specific sort of requirements and settings for those networks. Um, so, you know, there'll, there'll be a checklist of things if you were going to look at deploying the appliances that would be run through to, um, to make sure that the environment you'd be plugging into essentially is something that we feel comfortable with and, and is, a, is configured properly to handle, like you said, a lot of that east-west traffic that's going to happen between the nodes within the cluster. Um, I'm sure we could probably get some of the technical specifics from the XC team if that's the solution you're interested in, Don. Ben, Alan, uh, this is David. Thank you very much. It looks like that's the end of the Q&A right now, as far as I can tell. And um, we also have, we're approaching the top of the hour. So folks, this is David Kiesica, the liaison to Converged for Dell EMC. Thank you very much, Ben and Alan, um, for taking the time to uh, share a bunch of information with the, with the user group. And thank you all folks for attending. I'm going to hand it over now to Erica to wrap up the call. Great. Thank you, David. Um, again, thank you, Ben and Alan, for um, helping us out with this event today. We truly appreciate it. And thanks to all of those who are out there listening. Um, as guests, we also want to just remind you that we do have some great upcoming events. In June, we will be at Cisco Live holding a converged event. And then again in August, we will be at VMworld US holding a converged event. So both will be in Las Vegas, and we hope to see you there. Just a reminder, if you want to see more details and learn more about the context of our upcoming events, please visit our, our website, which is, again, convergedusergroup.com. Um, and you're, as soon as we're done with this event today, you will be t directed right there, so please um, enjoy exploring it. <clears throat> if you enjoyed this webinar, we will have another one in June. That will be June 21st, where we'll be talking about the bu business value realized and best practices for measuring the business value of converged and hyper-converged infrastructure system. So again, more details will be on the website with that. We will also get some invites out here pretty soon. And please visit our website, so convergedusergroup.com. And so from all of us here at Converged User Group, we want to thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. That does conclude our event, and you may now disconnect your lines. Presenters, please hold for a moment. <laughs>